Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We are here for another one of your questions about work. And today is actually the 300th day that we have done one of these, which is kind of wild to me. Um, and for those of you who are here for the first time, I'm Roy. I'm a startup investor in the future of work. And uh, we tackle every so often one of your questions about work, a dilemma you might have or something you're trying to figure out. You can see past episodes at thisisnotadvice.work where they're all compiled. And today we've got somebody who is part of the extended Bloomberg beta family, who is Maura Rivera, who is the CMO of qualified.com. And I'll let you describe what qualified does just so people know what it does. But Maura has been, you know, one of the top marketing tech executives in the industry, business insider, C-suite strategist of the year. And so what's amazing to me always is with people who have shown tremendous success in this particular, like in their particular field, how it all comes back to these simple things of how we treat other people. And so today's question is, how can I take care of my most important partners? I've got somebody who matters to me in getting my work done. What do I do for them? And thank you. Yeah, Roy, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. And episode number 300 is mighty impressive. Um, I think the way that I would answer this question is you have to show your team that you're willing to put in put in the work. And that's how you build trust. And that's how mm. you build a strong partnership. When I think about our team, like for me, I have a few different partners at work. I have our CEO who's my boss, I have my marketing team, and then I have kind of my peers on the leadership team. And there are probably different ways that I try and take care of those people, kind of depending on the dynamic and really what they need. Um, but as I talk about my marketing team specifically, so I've been at bigger companies, I used to work at Salesforce, but now I'm at an earlier stage company. And I had the unique experience of being marketer number one at this company. And so because I was marketer number one, I had to do the work. The first year we were building this company, I had to write every blog post, put every ad in market with our credit card. Like I had to do all of the things. And I'm so glad I did that because I learned more in that first year than I did in the last 10 years. But now that our marketing team has grown, I feel like there is this trust among our team because we're all willing to roll up our sleeves and do the hard work. And I feel like that's how you build trust is if people know you're willing to kind of, I said, grab an oar, get in the boat, yeah. them, not just be the captain, but be contributing, being giving feedback on different pieces and your feedback will be received because you kind of know what you're talking about. You might not be the expert in the field, but you've had experience in all of those. Kind of I practices. love that. The reality for some people is they get into a role where they hire somebody who does things they can't do. So a good example of that is a non-technical person who hires software engineers. And so they can't exactly open up the IDE and start fixing bugs or the other kind of failure mode I've seen is the merely theatrical version, like the executive who gets in to sweep the floors when they're really just doing it, you know, to show that they've done it as opposed to because it's a genuine way of contributing. And so how do you think about, I mean, the power of doing the work is so strong. How, uh, so I totally accept that. How do you resolve some of those issues when it's either theatrical or literally the person can't do it? Yeah. I mean, to your point, I think one of the best things you can do as you grow a team is hire experts in the field. So you can kind of give them advice and you can ask them questions, but you also trust them to go and run. Demand mm -hmm. gen, for example, I'm not an expert in demand gen. So I've hired this VP of demand gen who knows the ins and outs of ABM platforms and marketing ops and tech stack. Um, and so I feel like we have a good balance because I've done some of the work, but I also know she's the expert in the field. And to your point about kind of the sweeping, I think people call BS. People know when they see- Yeah, it's like, it's it's nonsense. Yeah, so it's, it's all a balance there, but I think just showing that you're willing to like jump in and figure stuff out with them, whether you're all working together on a product launch or a big announcement, like you can't, you need to get in the weeds, especially at a smaller stage company. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, I do think, I mean, this is related to a hiring strategy that we have that applies for startups, which is, um, we call it hiring by cell division. And what we mean by that is sometimes in early companies, people are tempted to hire the person first who can do all the things that they can't do. Mm -hmm. That's really tricky 
because at an early stage company, you often can't find somebody who can do all the things. It's not like a big company, like a qualified that's already a success and you know, blah, blah, blah. And so the answer is you got to hire people who do the thing that you have had to do yourself. You know, for example, if you were scheduling your meetings as a salesperson, you might hire an SDR, a junior sales rep, you know, to go out and do that kind of thing. And so oftentimes that hiring by sell division ends up with leaders who have done each of the tasks that are, um, that are required for their team. And I love the insight kind of from the manager side that that's an awesome way to build trust with those people too. So thank you. And I think one other thing that's kind of a totally different approach to this answer, but another way I think to build, kind of take care of your team and build that trust with everybody is also just thinking about the whole person. Like I love the silver linings of working remotely. I know you're in the office today, but I think working remotely over the last few years We've gotten to know people's partners and kids and more about their personal lives and people don't kind of um, protect that as much. And at the end of the day, I think people want to work with people who they like. People want to work with people who they have fun with. And so how can you like create that personal connection about things outside of work, which is harder now that we're all on Zoom and we're not always in person. But I think that's also a really important way to approach kind of taking care of your team is getting to know the people, getting to know what they care about, making sure that there's some levity injected into the meetings so that people enjoy working together. Yeah, I mean, I think there is this sense of it, and I struggle with this, of like, how do you get a little Tabasco sauce thrown into the day? And like, I'm so <laughs> eager to get through my list that it's like, well, you know, I am enjoying our Wordle channel on Slack, which by the way, your sister is really good at. Oh, no. Um, but yes, noted. Um, but it is that stuff, and you know, but and it requires some intention to do it in a way that feels legitimate. Um, mm -hmm. Anything else you want to add before we wrap? Nope, I think that's good. Thanks for having awesome. me, Roy. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And you know, for those who are watching for the first time, the reason we say it's not advice is because neither of us knows the right way for you to take care of your people in whatever situation you're in. Maura is sharing her experience in the domains that she's operated in successfully. I'm sharing mine. And ultimately, you have to make your own decisions. And if you want to see other perspectives, again, you can go to thisisnotadvice.work. And maybe you can come back for every 300th episode more when we do these, you know, something like that. I can't wait. Um, I love it. All right, cool. Thank you.